Right, well, now's the time of our service where kids are invited to come forward. So kids of all ages are invited to come. Did you have a good birthday this week? Yeah. Awesome. So come on in and join us up front. That's awesome. I can't wait to hear about it later, all right? All right, it is good to have you all here today. As I mentioned a moment ago, we are wrapping up our Rediscover Church series, talking about our final operational value that we are committed to making a redemptive impact in our communities. And so to illustrate that, we're looking at the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus gives a command to be salt and light. And so we're going to focus just briefly this morning together on one aspect of salt. Can we have that first slide up on the screen? Now, I'm going to be honest, I got a C minus in chemistry, but I'll never forget. I know Elizabeth is like, you think not? And so I'll never forget what this particular compound is because it was the final question in high school, but that is sodium chloride, also known as salt. And so there you have the scientific way of writing it. And so if you look at the next slide, please. Anybody know what that is? What is that, East Emerson? What is it? Gatorade. How many of you are at Gatorade? How many of you like red Gatorade? Very good. How many of you out there like red Gatorade? It's delicious. Now, Gatorade became so popular because of what they would call electrolytes, but it's basically just salt and other different ingredients. Salt is one of those really, really important elements that warm-blooded creatures like us need to survive. But also, salt is going to be found in the vast oceans that cover our planet. And salt was very, very important in the ancient world. It's not a stretch to say that we need salt each and every day of our lives to survive. And so I want to dig into, what did Jesus mean when he said, you are to be salt? So what did Jesus mean by that? So I need five volunteers to come up here. All right, Brent, you want to be first? All right, you're going to stand right over here and hold that cup. You want to come up next? Come on, buddy. All right, you're going to hold that one right there. All right, come on up. You got it? Easton, you want to, you want to participate? Yeah. Yeah, I promise you won't have to eat the salt. I, I Emerson's going to help out. I need one more, one more. Edward, come on up, buddy. All right, Miss Vandenboom's class in the house today, boys. Represent. All right. Very good. In your cups, kids, you will see salt. And so I want you to be very careful. It's a little bit corrosive, but if you kind of want to stick your fingers in there, just make sure afterwards you wash your hands. But take a look in there. Just touch the salt a little bit. What does it look like? What does it look like? Edward, what's it look like to you? It kind of looks like snow. It kind of looks like snow. Yeah, some crystals. Good, good, good. Yeah. Brent, what's it look like? It looks kind of like ice. That's right. And so... When Jesus said, you're supposed to be salt, and I'm supposed to be salt, and you're supposed to be salt, what did he mean? So let's look at the five different things, and then all of the adults can help us with the little multiple choice question. Here we go. Let's start with the first one. Did Jesus mean salt as a seasoning? Brent, can you hold this one for me? Awesome. What that means is adding important flavor and zest to the world. Is, is that what Jesus meant? Number two, or letter B, salt is a preservative. Can you hold that sign for me? Excellent. When you rub salt on to meat or fish, it slows decay. Back in the ancient world, they didn't have refrigerators, so salt was used as a preservative. Is it C? Salt is a fertilizer. Small amounts were added to the soil to improve the crop. So if you have a garden, if you have a little salt in there, that's going to help. That feels like ice. That does feel like ice, right? <laughs> it is. Look at your crystals. See? They're observing the salt crystals. They're right. Is it D? Salt as a currency. Then in the ancient world, salt was used sort of like money. So, so Emerson, the next time you want to get a toy, just pay with salt. That would be awesome. The word salary comes from the Latin word salarium. Right? That exactly right. So, Edward, sometime when you're with Jaja, I want you to try and pay for something with salt and see what the store says, okay? All right, or is it E? All of the above. Jesus was referring to salt, vital necessity for everyday life. So, kids, adults, are you ready to do the multiple choice quiz? When Jesus said, we are supposed to be salt, did he mean A, anybody? B, C, D? How many of you vote for E, all of the above? You guys are so smart. <laughs> Edward, 
Lord, you're right. It is all of the above. That in all the different ways, Jesus was trying to say, salt is so important to everyday life that we as followers of Jesus need to be just as important to the world. Because without the church, the world is a very different place because he calls his followers to be salt in every way, shape, or form. And we talked about today, as well as life. Let's give our volunteers a round of applause. I'm going to collect the salt gonna there. I'm going to eat this little piece. Oh, and just don't eat it, okay, Edward? I won't. I won't. All right. Good job. Thanks for listening, guys. You can grab a piece of candy before you return to your seats. And if you attend preschool through first grade, you can head to rest stop with your parents' permission. Everyone else, if you could open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. And that is where we're going to be today. Discovering Church. Oh, that kind of really works. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, we have spent the past, well, this will be our fifth sermon, um, going through our operational values and our vision statement here at Red Air Ministries. You might remember that our vision statement is um, join the journey on the road with Jesus, building relationships along the way. And we have these operational values as ways to live out that vision statement. And so I remind you of our journey guide. It has a snapshot of our ministry, and you can pick one of these up today, or I can send one to you if you're at home. Um, but keep in mind that today we finish with we are committed to making a redemptive impact into our communities. That's wherever we are. Wherever we go, we are bringing the salt and the light of Jesus with us, right? We are being the salt and light to the world. That's what Ben's going to talk about today. Um, as we wrestle with this, it's good to remember that this operational value was really the whole reason Red Arrow Ministries was started as a church. For those of you that are new to our ministry, you might not know that Paul Paul Christian Reformed Church was, a, was another church that met in this building, and they came to the end of their ministry and they gifted us with their resources so that we could be salt and light into our community, so that, the, that we could partner with God to make a redemptive impact. So as you listen today, be thinking about, this is the whole point of our church. This is why God has called us here. So as we look towards the future, as we think to next steps, we can't lose sight of the redemptive impact we can have within our community. So before we look at the passage, we have to understand the context. And so Jesus has just called his disciples. He's done a miraculous work. And... A large crowd had gathered. Now, as that crowd gathered, Jesus realized he needed to take his closest followers, the disciples, aside. And what we see in today's passage is part of a larger Sermon on the Mount. Sir, can we see that? Jesus went up to a mountain, away from the crowd, sat down, and started to give a list of both the blessings and the responsibilities that go with being a follower of Jesus. And what I want you to read there is there's lots of perks, but there's also lots of obligations. Being part of a covenant community like a church, you should experience how membership has its privileges. However, at the same time, those benefits come with certain demands. And yes, I use that word demands intentionally. Demands that God has placed on our lives. Why? We belong to Him. And so, following what is known as the Beatitudes, which conclude with verse 11, and this sets the stage for today's passage, Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so keep this important tension in mind as Christ describes some ways in which we ought to make a redemptive impact both in our community and the world around us. The text will be up on the screen where Jesus continues saying, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And so notice when Jesus is trying to use a metaphor, he uses an object lesson that is common for everyone that is hearing. We even today, 2,000 years later, understand the importance of salt, but also that of light. But in the ancient world, as I tried to illustrate with the kids, salt was such a vital part of their experience that the disciples, the first followers of Jesus, would hear this metaphor, and immediately they would recognize that salt is a vital and essential element to all human existence. And so notice, Jesus says that you kind of got to be like salt. He says, no, 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 you are salt of the earth. And so what does that mean? Well, throughout history, Christians have understood that we are called not just to stay excluded, exclusive and sort of secluded from the rest of culture. We're supposed to be interacting the culture. Over history, the church has done things like started schools, started hospitals, did promoted great works of art, paintings and sculptures, as well as write and encourage great music. The church has done this because they wanted to make a redemptive impact and to be the salt of the earth. But of all the different options that we saw with the kids, the one I think is the most important, at least for us today, is that of salt as a preservative. That we live in a culture that is increasingly toxic and increasingly hostile to the influence of followers of Jesus. Well, why is that? Well, because we're standing for something that the world has yet to recognize that they need. And just like when you're very, very thirsty and you're, you're thirsty for water, if you were to drink a cup of sand, that wouldn't quench your thirst. And as the culture continues to find their, their meaning and their purpose in the surrounding culture, the church is to step up and say, no, wait a minute. Let us look at what Christ has given us. And so when we look at the opposition we face and how we're supposed to be salt, if we could see that next slide, please, Sarah. The church is trying to be salt to help preserve our culture while the culture is doing everything in its power to remove the influence of church from mainstream of American life. At present, we still have some protection from persecution, right? We're all here worshiping today. We're able to watch online. We are free to meet for public worship, but our freedom is limited by those who say that Christians are to be tolerated only if they keep out of the public square. The minute we take the message of Christ into the culture, we run into the resistance of the pagan culture. And so sometimes Christians meet that opposition and say, forget about it. We don't want to talk to our friends, our neighbors. We don't want to go to a homeless camp and pray for people because maybe someone's going to get angry or offended. What happens if we as Christians lose that perseverance and that idea of being salt? We see Jesus points it out. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how could it be made salty? Again, I don't know about you, I've never heard of salt losing its saltiness. And for the first century people, they'd be like, that's impossible. If you're salt, you can't just lose your saltiness. So what did Jesus mean? He meant that if we lose sight of the responsibilities, the obligations that we have to be that salt to the earth, what good are we here for? As, as Pastor Maria pointed out in the introduction, this idea of making a redemptive impact is why this church was started. There's a famous expression, if Red River Ministries was to close today, just close our doors, say we're done, would the community even notice? Would they realize that we went away? And so that's the image that Jesus is given. This is where this idea of salt losing and salt is where we get the, the Greek word is for moron. It would be moronic for Christians to not be salt. How could it be made salt again? Well, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And what would happen in the first century when they would take salt primarily from the Dead Sea, when they would use it in their different rituals, sometimes the sodium chloride would sort of leach out of the dirt. And they'd realize that it was no longer good for anything but throwing it on marble floors so that people wouldn't slip when it was wet. Just like we use salt on Michigan roads and it's covering all of our cars right now at this moment. But that is what we're called to be salt of the earth. And so sort of mixing metaphors, he moves on to the second object lesson, but we are also to be light. Notice it doesn't say kind of like a light. No, no, no. You, I, are the light of the world. 
Now, is, is it us that brings the light? No. Remember, when Jesus entered into the world at Christmas, at the Incarnation, the light of the world entered into a very dark and dreary place. And so what Jesus is saying is that we as his followers, as we are trying to be salt, we're also to be light. But the light source is not inside of us. We are reflecting the glory and the brilliance of Christ who called us into his kingdom. And so when we walk around, we should be a light to those in darkness. How many people do we know that are stumbling around in life almost like they're wearing a blindfold and they're tripping and falling and having all of these difficulties because of choices that they're making and they don't understand that what they're doing is walking around in the darkness. And so we're called to be a light. And so here I have this little lantern here. Now notice this is battery powered. I didn't get an actual fire lamp. Now again, in the ancient world, they would have oil that would then burn so they didn't have electricity. So in addition to not having refrigerators to preserve food, they didn't have the ability to just flip a switch. Now, let's just say that you were wandering around your house and you knew there was different obstacles. You would hold this light up high. You wouldn't kind of hide it. You wouldn't turn it real low. You would do whatever it took to walk it around. Now, we see this illustration in the text that a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, I'll never forget when I was over at Deming's old property, Kevin said, look, in the winter, you could sit on this hill and you actually see Timber Ridge from the property. If you've been driving around our part of Michigan during the night, you could actually see all of the lights at the ski resort from miles around. Can you guys see it from your house? Yeah. Barry gets on the roof and says, I can see the light, right? <laughs> But again, when all of the Christians working together, if we're truly going to be the light, when we are gathered to do something like, as I mentioned, what Maddie led the church to do yesterday, it should draw people to us. People should say, what is that? What is going on in that place? What is that going on with that group of people? And just like salt can't lose its saltiness, Jesus says, neither do people light a lamp and put it on a bowl. And so this happens sometimes as Christians. We're given the light of the gospel, right? When we read God's word, we're able to understand it. Just like you can't read a book in the dark, the Holy Spirit that dwells within us enlightens our mind to understand scripture. Sometimes people, when they're given the light, are like, I don't really love this light. I'm just going to keep it just to myself. I, I don't want to share it with anybody. But how is that fulfilling the obligation that God has called us? They don't hide a lamp. No, they put it on a lampstand. And that everyone in the house can see. And so the passage ends with this summary statement, and we sang a song about that at the starter service today. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, one of the things we have to understand as a church, that as we enter into places, maybe even places we feel uncomfortable, that we bring the light of Christ. And if we're truly going to be the salt of the earth, we need to understand how necessary we are to the people around us. As we see in this last quote, we see that Jesus' disciples possesses a kingdom life, which produces good deeds from a changed life. Bearing the light of the gospel in both message and life will bring people to know that the kingdom of heaven truly is in the world. And they will glorify their heavenly Father. The presence of the kingdom produces changed lives. And that's why this is part of our operational values. That is why Jesus put his light in us to go out into the world, even places no one would expect us to be, and see lives being redeemed. And so think back to the children's illustration. Do we have any chemists? with us here today? No? Again, C minus. I barely passed. My friend Lamont, if you're watching, buddy, thanks for your help, man. Could not have gone through it. But again, this was the final exam question, if you remember, Lamont. And we were supposed to write down what is the common name for that chemical. Sodium chloride, salt, is such a vital part of our lives. And great, granted, in the ancient world, it's even more important. And, and so hopefully Edward won't embarrass you too much when he goes to the store, tries to buy something with some salt. He could just say, that's what Jesus did. No, that's not what he did, but don't say that. But, but again, this idea of salt, 
This idea that such a small thing could be so valuable, so essential to human life, we have to understand that we are salt. This is what we're called to do. But we live in, and I was talking to one of my friends when he walked in today, that we're living in what's called a cancel culture. That if someone says or does something that they don't like, a group of people, a mob, sort of comes around and says, you're done. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your social media presence. Because they can't handle the salt and the truth that the church and Christians are trying to point out. We're not trying to be mean. We're trying to say, this is what God has created us to do. This is the way that God has created us to live. We want to be a help, not a hindrance to the world around us. So as we look at the different aspects we talked about today, salt is a seasoning, salt is a preservative, salt is a fertilizer, salt as currency. Yes, I believe and scholars agree that it is all of the above that Jesus was referring to when he called us, you are salt of the earth. So if you look at this last one, what we have to understand is that as we experience that persecution, we are seeing fulfilled what Jesus said just before today's text. So this is the message paraphrase, and I'm going to end here. Count yourself blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give cheer even. For though they don't like it, Jesus says, I do. And all of heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. And that is when Jesus says to us, let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt. Seasoning that brings out the God flavors of the earth. And you're here to be light. Bringing out the God colors in this world. And so, Pastor Maria, how does all of this fit with our final operational value that we are committed to making a redemptive impact in our communities? Thanks. Yeah. So as I brought up the journey guide earlier today, and I talked about the operational values, this value, uh, these values are not like ranked in some sort of priority. If you've taken turn one, you know we wrestle with what it means to have ownership in our church is to live out these values and to have them be a snapshot of how we do ministry. But they're not ranked by priority. They're stepping stones. You see, we started with praying for somebody who does not yet know Jesus because we know that the Holy Spirit acts in a person's life before they even know who they've encountered. And then we started, then we talked about developing a relationship with somebody that doesn't know the Lord because we want to be a presence in their life so that they know um, that they can count on us. That's being the salt. It's being the light in their life. And then we share the truth of Jesus Christ within that relationship. Once a person has encountered Christ and they know the truth, they give their life to Christ. And if you've never done that, if you've never um, experienced what it's like to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, I encourage you to pick up one of our journey guides. There is a prayer on the back that walks you through surrendering your life to Christ. And if you'd like to talk to somebody about that, you know, Ben or I or Ben Newhouse, anyone on staff or elders, we would all love to pray with you as you walk through that. And then... Once you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, you're committed to deepening your relationship with God and with his church, his people. Finally, or no, and then we go to being a place where people can grow in prayer and worship. That's what we talked about last week. These are spiritual disciplines that draw us closer to our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that living those stepping stones makes a redemptive impact. And what happens when you get to the end is you start all over. It's a circle and you keep going. Red Arrow has some commitments that we've asked you to live out. So we started out with reaching out by reaching one, and we said, be intentional. Make room for one person in your life. I shared with you that we have this Duplo, and we all have capacity for six to eight meaningful relationships in our life, and so we asked you to be intentional about that relationship with somebody who does not yet know Jesus. 
Well, I've got two more pegs that I want to talk to you about today, right? Another peg in your life is to be intentional about your walk with, with the Lord, about growing. That's one of our operation values, remember? That we're committed to deepening our relationship with God. And so the commitment that we have that emphasizes this is that we are one road but many journeys. As a church, we're all on the same road, but we all have individual walks with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this was a commitment that we laid out last year that kind of showed what it meant to be intentional about growing in your faith. If you'd like to talk about this, we can do that. Um, but growing in your faith also includes disciplines like stewardship, and so we encourage you to take a look at the stewardship journey. Um, and then as I said, role in relationship, right? The other peg that I want you to think about how to open up is a peg for your church family. How do we be intentional about building relationships within our community, right? One for the community outside of us, one for the Lord himself, and one for the relationships in this building. So these are commitments, and these are all ways that we ask you to live out being the salt and the light to the world. Um, and then, you know, if you've taken turn one, you know, we talk about, when we get to turn one on this operational value, we talk about how this value is so hard to measure. It's hard to figure out how we're doing on this and what kind of impact we're having. Ben asked a great question that kind of helps us wrestle with this. Would the community even notice if we were gone? Right, that's a great place to start. But after 12 years of ministry, how is Red Arrow doing with this operational value? So I encourage you to pray through that. And if the Lord kind of sparks some thoughts for you, I'd like to hear them. Right? Shoot me an email, call me, we'll sit down, have a cup of coffee. I'd like to know, you know, where, where are we being challenged? Where are we being stretched? Where are fresh new ways, like the youth worship band, or like homeless kids? Um, I forgot to mention during announcements, by the way, if you go by any communities where you see homeless people, there are extra kits that you can take and deliver. And we thank the team for putting those together. They're behind that wall. Um, but you have been redeemed to be a blessing, right? The verse that we use in turn one is Galatians 3.14. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. What this verse is saying is that we've been redeemed in order to go to the world and be a blessing for them. Um, and so, you know, each time we end turn one, we watch a video. It's made by the skit guys, but there, there's pictures or stories of different people. They're not actors. They're real life people, and it is their real life journey. And God has redeemed them, and maybe one of their stories will resonate with you, because maybe it's how God has redeemed you as well. But what we read is this. It has been our prayer. That's the prayer of the leadership of Red Arrow and the prayer of all of the agencies and churches that have supported us along the way, and all of our partners, that the stories that we're about to watch would be the stories of Red Arrow Ministries. We have asked God to use us to make a redemptive impact in the lives of our community so that the people are no longer who they used to be, but redeemed. Let's watch the video. <laughs> 